On behalf of the family of Jim Norris, thank you for being here. It is a privilege to serve with that man and to celebrate a life well lived with you today. Uh, my name is Michael Ent. I'm the pastor here at Raleigh Avenue some uh, several years ago. <laughs> uh, the Norrises made their home in Homewood and um, started having babies. And they found Raleigh Avenue Baptist Church. And he had uh, put his faith in Christ as a young man at a, a church out in Bessemer. But uh, upon finding Raleigh Avenue, decided that he needed to get rebaptized, join this church. And then uh, a few years later, he was um, uh, elected as a deacon and served here uh, many, many years. And he kept us all rolling, kept us all in stitches. Um, but we are, we're going we're gonna to celebrate today. Uh, as hard as it is, uh, that's our charge today is to celebrate. So would you, uh, would you bow your heads with me and we'll begin. Father, we want to say thank you for a man that has impacted so many people. Thank you for a man who has given his, his life uh, in service to his neighbors. Thank you for a man who has um, demonstrated what that kind of servant leadership looks like to his family and to his church family and his community. And Father, we know that nobody is perfect, but we are thankful that, that at one point it was Jim Norris that handed his life, imperfections and all, over to you and you took care of his account you forgave him. And because of that, we are able to celebrate today. Even though we grieve, we can still celebrate. And so, Father, I pray that you would govern our, um, our thoughts uh, and our hearts and our words this afternoon for your glory in honor of Jim, but also in honor of his Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us begin our service of remembrance and celebration of Jim Norris by singing Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. It's hymn 104, but the words will be displayed. Let's stand together as we sing this great hymn of the faith. stanza when we've been there when we've been Wait. 
and peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, Haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The drum shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. John chapter 11, starting in verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But, now, but even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Arthur, James, Jim, Norris of Homewood passed away peacefully at his residence on Thursday, the 8th of February, 2024. He was 76 years old. Born in Anniston, Alabama, on June 10th, 1947, he was the son of the late Robert and Helen Norris, Jim graduated from Bessemer High School in 1967 and joined the United States Army, serving two tours in Vietnam. A Homewood firefighter, Jim served the residents of Homewood for 33 years and nine months before retiring as a lieutenant in 2005. A member and deacon of Raleigh Avenue Baptist Church, he also served 
others for 41 years in his second job, <laughs> working at industrial fire and safety equipment. He was preceded in death by his brother, Robert William Norris. Jim is survived by his loving wife of 53, almost 54 years, Jean Norris, by his daughter, Terry Norris, by his son, David Norris, by his grandson, Anthony T. Savage, and his wife, Corinne, and by his mother, or by his brother, John Norris. We are listening to the passage that Steve just read, and yet mindful of the black and white print that we see in the newspaper online as an obituary. And those two don't really add up. Because the first one, the passage Steve read, talks about a, a guy that had passed away, Lazarus, and his two sisters a few days later, they're wondering why Jesus didn't show up because he had been going throughout the land healing people, uh, turning uh, water into wine, <laughs> Uh, uh, making uh, meals for thousands of folks out of a little boy's sack lunch, doing all these miracles, but where was, where was their miracle? Their brother, one of Jesus' close friends, needed a miracle, and yet Jesus didn't show up for another four days. And it looked very final, very final. And we read an obituary like this, and we see a, 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 a body, Jim's body, right here in front of us. And, and, and we're thinking to ourselves, this looks final. And so we've got to reconcile, what on earth is the Bible talking about? How on earth can we hear those words, even if he dies, will he live? and yet read an obituary. Today we are tasked with celebrating. I say that because that's what Gene told me we had to do. All right? <laughs> Those are our instructions. And I appreciate that. And you know the difference between a funeral and a celebration, or maybe a memorial, it's not whether or not the body's presence. That, that's, what, uh, that's what Emily Post will tell you in, the, in the, uh, the guidebook. It's really dependent upon who you honor. If we are here today just to honor Jim Norris, well, we can stop there and just call it a funeral. But I told you earlier, several years ago, when he was a young man, he put his faith in Jesus Christ. And he followed through with that. Now, I know we've got enough colorful stories in the room to think, <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> he was no saint. Boy, saints come in all shapes and sizes. And I know that Jim put his faith exclusively in Jesus. And so here's the thing. We can celebrate Jim Norris today only because we can celebrate the Savior that he trusted, the Lord that he put himself under, that he submitted himself to, and that's Jesus. That's it. That's the difference between a funeral and a celebration. And so today, I just want to challenge you, and we're going we're gonna to be true to our word, Miss Jean. We're going to celebrate. Part of celebrating means we're going to remember. And I'm going to share some things. I'm going to speak from the scriptures and but at the end, I want to give you a chance as well to share some of those stories. And you can keep them brief, and some of you, you may have to edit out a few words here and there to keep them G-rated. We're in church, right? But I guarantee you, if you will step out in boldness and just share a story, a memory or two, this family is going to treasure them for a long time. So if, if you're a little shy, let me just say, find some boldness, because it means a lot. But we're going to remember. We're going to remember and we're going to grieve as we do. This is a day we've set aside to do just that. We're going to make it count. When I think of Jim, <laughs> three words come to mind. Funny, tough, tender. 
funny, tough, tender. You may could add some of the vocabulary. You may come up with some words of your own, but funny, when I would go visit him in the hospital, and uh, if he was awake, and oftentimes he was, uh, I couldn't tell if it was the drugs talking or if it was Jim Norris, and, and he, he, wanted you to, he wanted you to think in those terms. He would, share, um, he would share what's going on. He would tell me about all the physical ailments, and it would take a serious tone. I mean, he had been battling cancer for 12 years. I mean, he was defying gravity for 13 years. The doctors told him, hey, you're not going to last very long. They used the word terminal quite often with him. But he would tell me this whole long list, this longer list of things that were, were happening to his body, that he was out of control and uh, he had no control over these things. And he would look at me and he'd say, I don't know what I'm going to do when I get old. <laughs> and just bring some levity into a painful moment. In fact, I... I, I I don't know if y'all have picked out what you're going to put on his tombstone, uh, but one joke he would tell me all the time was uh, about a, an old fellow who had died with a lot of symptoms, and, and on his tombstone it said, I told you I was sick. Have y'all heard that one? Am I the only one? <laughs> no, he shared those quite a bit. He would walk into a waiting room with other patients who were waiting for cancer treatment and you can imagine the gloom and doom of that kind of room that he would walk into and by the time he was leaving that place he had them all laughing he would find something to smile about a true gentleman really could set people at ease but he was also tough I guess from the outside, you might, if you didn't know him, you'd think, oh, this guy's a little crusty. <laughs> He's a little crusty. Uh, as a first responder, we have some police officers in the room as well. I know we have a lot of firemen, personnel that show up at a scene where you basically see the worst of humanity on display. And just so you know, this church, we pray for you on a regular basis. We're, we value you, and in part, we, we have an understanding of that because of Jim Norris, because of guys like Dale Robertson. Because we know you walk into those scenes, and it's, it's easy to kind of switch off your heart and your passion and your emotions because you've, you've kind of got to go into professional business mode. You can't let it get too personal. So there was kind of a tough, crusty exterior, but at the same time, a tenderness. One of those stories that, that Jim shared with me, he's probably shared with many of you, uh, it, and I find it very revealing as to how much he valued life. He came upon this scene, and one, one guy had taken a car and ran over another guy broke his legs in half. And fire department shows up, the ambulatory service shows up, the police are there, they, they, you know, piecing this all together, they're interviewing the guy. Why did you do this? This kid on the, on the ground with his legs broken in half is likely never going to walk again. And the kid, this just stuck and resonated in Jim's mind so much so that he told me the story multiple times the answer, why did you do this? He disrespected me. He disrespected me. For some way, somehow, in that young man's mind, that added up and justified him slamming a car into this other young man's legs. And I watched as Jim would just wrestle with the value of human life. Because it, it, just, it just didn't add up. Because Jim valued human life. He saw how precious it was. And that 
really explained a lot about who he is. That explained a lot about how he raised his family, how he treated his wife, how he served among his brothers and sisters in Christ here at Raleigh. That all adds up when you think about it. Jim would probably be the first to say, hey, when I die, don't, don't spend a lot of time on me. <laughs> My grandmother, she used to say, when I die, just don't, don't give me a, don't spend money on a casket and elaborate funerals. She said, just roll me in a sheet and throw me in a ditch. <laughs> we didn't do that, by the way. We did not take her advice. And we're not going to take Jim's advice all the way. We got to talk about him. We got to share. And I hope you have some memories. And again, I just want to prime the pump as you're thinking through how colorful, what a friend, what an impact he has made on this town, on so many households. We are so blessed. Theologian William Carey, he would say something similar. He, he said, when I die, don't talk about William Carey. Talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Because again, we're not here just to honor Jim Norris. We're here to honor the Christ, the, the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord, that actually was capable of doing something about Jim's sin problem. The only one who had lived a righteous life and could step in and make sure that Jim had payment into a right relationship with his Creator. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 4, and I'll just read it to you. If you've got your Bible, feel free. We're told something strange about death. And if you just read through it real quickly, you may not catch it, but I think we're smart enough and all alert enough. Let me, just, let me just share this. I'll read it briefly. As Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing to a group of Christians who are dying for their faith. They're not dying of cancer. They're dying of because they're Christians. And they want to know, hey, what happens to these folks when, when they die? If they miss, the, if they miss Jesus' return, <laughs> if they die before he comes back, what, what happens? And so here's Here's how Paul, the Apostle Paul, describes sleep. He uh, describes, uh, I already gave it away, describes death. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep. That's the word he uses. So that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again in the same way, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by a revelation from the Lord. We who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. And then he talks about that return of the Lord. And then he says this, Therefore encourage one another with these words. Now, the passage Steve read, though he dies, yet shall he live. And Paul mentions this, this idea here that, that those who are dead in Christ are not really dead. They've only fallen asleep. This is strange language, again, considering what appears to be the finality of death. Where would Paul get this idea? You don't have to thumb through the New Testament very far to see example after example. Mary and Martha, John chapter 11, again, we see it. Lazarus is raised from the dead. If you go to the, the Gospel of Mark, you see, you see a, a guy who is, uh, who is pretty distraught. He's a leader of a, of a synagogue. He's like a religious leader in the town, and he is distraught because his daughter is dying. He knows it. Everybody knows it. He runs because he hears Jesus has come to town, so he's hoping to get one of those miracles for his household. And about the time he gets to Jesus, they tell, they tell this synagogue leader, hey, don't, don't bother. It's too late. It's too late. 
And Jesus looks at him and says, hey, uh, don't worry. <laughs> They're wrong. And he marches on to this guy's house anyway. And he walks in. There are people there who are the professional mourners. They've got the John Rideout's uh, 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 group, the Elmwood Cemetery folks, ready to roll. And Jesus says, y'all need to step outside. And he goes by the bedside of this little 12-year-old girl who is, as we would refer to her, passed on. She's dead. And he takes her by the hand. And he says in Aramaic, Talitha Kaum, little girl, get up. And guess what? At the words of Jesus... This little girl gets up. Nobody has that kind of power except Jesus. And Paul and Peter and John and Mark and the list goes on and on all recognize that and they point to that in the New Testament because they want us to know that when it comes to death, if you die with your faith in Christ alone, it's really more like a celestial nap Does that make a celebration out of a funeral? You bet it does. You bet it does. Paul also refers to this in 1 Corinthians 15 when he's talking us through the gospel. He says, I passed on to you as of most importance what I also received, that number one, Christ died for our sins. That would tell us that there's a holy God and we're clearly not him. And he died for our sins out of love. That's consistent, right? There are angels swarming around God's throne saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When the prophet Isaiah gets a glimpse of something like that, he goes, Woe is me! I am undone! I am unclean! In light of God's holiness. But it's his love that compels him to step into that situation and address our sin. As, as the gospel writer here, Christ says, Christ died for our sin. We don't hear that word a lot. We need to hear that word often. That's a big problem. That's our problem. It's absolutely our problem. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried because that's what you do when people die, right? You bury them. Then thirdly, this is the kicker. This is the funeral to celebration. Let's cue the party that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Boy, that's the kicker. <laughs> and Jesus, the Lord has been telling us this is going to happen. Your sins need a payment. They need to be paid for. Jesus is the one who's going to be able to do it. He's going to do it by his death. And he's going to win us the victory by his resurrection. And we get to participate in that. And because of that, he's the one who has the authority to call death in Christ a now. Him and him alone. Reading on in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, I love this. And he appeared to Cephas, to the twelve. Then he appeared to over 500 brothers. This is history we're talking about. He appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. You get it. You get it. There is no other name under heaven and earth that can make this kind of difference in a moment like this. None. And some will say, that's exclusive, Michael. You're being exclusive. No, no, no. God is being clear. He is being clear. And he's given us one name to put our faith in. I just want to challenge you today. These are the facts. These are the facts. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die ever. Do you believe this? If you have not put your faith in Christ, 
exclusively. And why I say exclusively is because it's, it's, not your, it's not your vicar, it's not your pastor, it's not your church, it's not your how many times you can go to Sunday school or church, it's not how good a person you are. You, your name doesn't get to be there. It's his. It's his. It's not Jesus plus some other cacophony of religious beliefs. It's his. He's the one who has reserved the right for that privilege. Jesus and Jesus alone. This is very real for Jim Norris. This is his reality because this is reality. In Louisiana, there was a trial that held the attention of the entire state. The year was 1982. And a man was condemned to die for murder, the murder of a family. As he sat on death row, his attorneys frantically tried to rescue, tried to secure a pardon for their client. They used just about every means within their legal grasp. As the hour approached, all hope seemed to fade. Then, unexpectedly, at 11.30 p.m., 30 minutes before he was to die in the gas chamber, the governor of Louisiana extended a full pardon to the man. The attorneys were overjoyed as they brought the news to their client, as they told him of his freedom. Something happened that brought the entire state of Louisiana to a standstill. He refused the pardon. At precisely 12 o'clock midnight, they strapped the man to the chair, and within a few moments, the He was dead. The entire state was in shock. The man had a full pardon, yet he chose to die anyway. A fierce legal battle erupted over the issue. Was the man pardoned because the governor offered the pardon? Or was he pardoned when he accepted the pardon? The highest court in the state of Louisiana was the arena for the debate. Ultimately, it was decided that the pardon cannot go into effect until it is accepted. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, yet shall he live. Do you Believe this. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, today, today is a gift from you. And it is your gift to us. As hard as it may feel to get out of bed on a day like today, where we feel like we are out of sorts, We're at a loss. Even in the midst of today, we can find hope and we can grieve with hope. Father, I thank you for this family and for the strength that you have given them and the friends around them to help them rally and not just get through today, but get through the days ahead, the weeks ahead, the anniversaries that will hit from out of nowhere. I thank you for the opportunity to be reminders along the way of how gracious you have been by giving us Jim Norris. And Father, we would not wish him back because we know the pain and the suffering that he endured. We trust you with him. And we thank you for today. And Father, we also thank you for the reality of one name, the name Jesus, that makes all the difference. And I pray that if there's anybody here within the sound of my voice who has not put their faith exclusively in Jesus, I pray they would square off with you today. They would not put their head on their pillow without bowing it in your presence, getting off the throne that is reserved for you and you alone. Father, thank you for the forgiveness that is accessible through your Son. Thank you for your patience that is allowing us the opportunity to come humbly and repent and believe 
and be among those, perhaps one day, who will be in need of being taken by the hand and told to wake up, to get up. But Lord, we await that day in your strength and your power and for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing of the sacrifice our Lord Jesus Christ made on that old rugged cross. By dying, he gives us life. Let us sing the old rugged cross as we stand. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dear stand best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean cross so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll change I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The last stanza to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will. I want to give us a few moments, uh, perhaps beginning with, with some of the family. If there is a memory that you would like to share or you feel is appropriate, I want to give you some time to do that, again, in the spirit of celebration. Uh, I am Father Milton Gibson. I'm from I'm John, uh, Jim's brother-in-law, and uh, even though we are sort of on the different Holds as far as uh, denominations go, you know, he and I got along very well. You know, when Jim was born, I think the good Lord said, "I'm, you know what? Have this boy is a little different from anybody else we've ever seen." And it, why don't we just throw that mold away and we'll start over with somebody else? And that was Jim. Jim was an absolute character. He loved God. He loved this church. He used to talk to me all the time about it. And when I decided, I have not always been a priest, when I decided to go to seminary and walk away from 
a different life I had before, uh, he constantly reminded me of how proud he was that I had done that. Um, of course, Jim always had something cute to say about everything. And, uh, you know, he kind of laughed. He said, you know, you're just having to give up all that sin, and then you're going to have to be a good guy from now on. But, but he meant that. I think Jim had a different attitude than most people have about life. He found not necessarily something that was humorous in every situation, but you guys go out on it. I used to be the, the uh, fire commissioner in Slidell, Louisiana, and we used to have all kinds of chats over the things that we had seen, and I'd been a paramedic years ago. And, and you know, you, unfortunately, when you go out and you go on a scene and you see things that are really tragic, sometimes they are even... There are some things that are a little humorous that come out of some of the things. And Jim would always find something to do with it. And he even did it when he got sick. You know, he, he would make little comments all the time. And he didn't necessarily do that with everybody. But you pretty well summed him up as best as anybody could. And I really appreciate what you have said about Jim. And, but I once... I can't really tell the story exactly how it went on, but just to show how he was. And he came to my daughter's high school graduation. <laughs> um, and he brought uh, Jean and my wife Beth's mother down, and he took about two days to get there. And we lived in Slidell, and it was a seven-hour drive. But, I mean, he takes two days to get there because he wanted to take all the back roads and see everything. But that was just Jim. And so when he got there, he said, oh, my gosh, I walked off and left my clothes. And all I've got on is this orange shirt and a pair of fire department work pants and a pair of boots. So we go to the, we go to the graduation service and... Uh, I knew he was feeling a little bit out of place, and most of the people were dressed up in a coat and tie, whatever, and we're sitting there, and the principal gets up, and he starts talking, and Jim says, keep studying this guy, and he's going, is he one of those? But Jim can't say anything quietly. And I'm wanting to climb under the table, but the fact and the, but I could hear everybody around us snickering of the thing. But that was just Jim. You never knew what he was going to say. But Jim had a serious side too. And I I saw him about three weeks before he passed. And we prayed together, and I anointed him and prayed for him. And one of the things that is always hard for me to do is to when do you quit praying that the person get well when you know God's calling them home? And it's very difficult to change the tune of the prayer. You don't want to frighten the person, but you know that God, at this point, is calling them home. But Jim was, he was a big guy, not only in stature, but he was a big guy in heart. Jim would do, he'd go out of his way to do anything for anybody that needed help. Sometimes you didn't want him to help, but that was fine. I mean, he didn't care. He was going to do something good. But we're going to miss Jim. We're going to miss his unquiet comment sometime. But I, I was told not to tell that story, but I just had to tell it. <laughs> it was, that was funny. I've laughed about it for years, so. But uh, I uh, thank all of you on behalf of the family, behalf of the family for being here today to remember Jim and this celebration of his life. Because it was certainly a life that was full of fun, and I know that there were some heartaches in Jim's life. But he overcame that, and he 
It's like everything else. He just found some good in everything that happens. And thank you all for being here. And God bless you. My name's Harold Parker. I work with Jim. Well, he, he came to the fire department about 14 months before I did. So we was all young. A lot of cutting up. A lot of fun. A lot of serious work. But there's one story I want to tell on Jim. There's a lot of stories I could tell on Jim. <laughs> this one's pretty good. We had a call on Kensington Road. For the ones that don't are not familiar with Kensington Road, it's got a high side and a lower side. Uh, and a lady had called power line down. So the engine, engine company went out, and Jim was riding shotgun, which is the lieutenant side, but he was acting lieutenant that shift. And when Jim and them pulled up, he saw Captain Davis pull up in his car behind Jim. Captain Davis had noticed the little lady that called was standing on her front porch up high. And when uh, Jim jumped out of the truck, saw the captain. Do y'all remember the ads on TV years ago about Vern? Vern would stick his hand in the window and grab the electrical wire on the TV or something like that. Jim reached down and grabbed the cable. It was telephone cable. The lady thought it was a power line. Jim grabbed the cable and started going, yeah! hollering and screaming and Reggie is looking at that little lady up on the porch going oh oh and fell back in the chair Jim just throws it down gets in the truck and says he's in service and leave Reggie had to go to the top of the hill and calm the little lady down Jim was a good guy we all miss we'll miss Jim he was a life of everything he'd done. Always kept something going at the fire hall. And he always kept it light. We'll miss Jim. You know, you said they broke the mold after they made Jim. No, they did not. Five years later, my husband was born. My late husband was born. 1952. And it was the same mold. Firemen. Joker, <laughs> serious, and and not serious, absolutely not serious. Is that part of a fireman thing? I don't know. But you know, I can remember going to Jean's shop making cards, and it seems like every time I went, and I didn't tell him where I was going, I would get a phone call at Jean's shop going, are you at Jean's? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> like how do you know? But then as my husband got sicker and sicker, um, He's, he got where he'd like to go with me. So he'd come over to Jean's shop with me. And I don't know how Jim would show up. I don't know if it's because Jean told him that Ralph was there. Or if Jim just wanted to come and see his bride. Um, because he'd just show up. But here is my, my husband who has, has passed away many years ago. But what a bonding they had. These two firemen telling jokes and laughing while the ladies were over there looking at card making stuff. But what a joy it brought to my husband, who was very, very sick, for Jim to come. And it just seems like he, he always just had that sixth sense that Ralph was there. Ralph was there. And he would come and they would laugh and they'd tell firemen stories and they'd just cut up and carry on and let me do my thing with Jean. <laughs> and what a joy that was. And you know, the last time that I saw Gene, I was right here in this church making cards with Gene. And Jim came in the back, and he was sitting there. And I had a, the honor, the honor to pray over him for healing, for healing, knowing that it's been, it had been a long fight. Was, didn't know how it was going to turn out. But what an honor it was to get to pray over this man, a man that brought such joy. And you could tell had a joy for living and a joy for life. 
But you know, in, in Revelation, John says, he sees the heavens open and the dead in Christ will rise. They rise before the rest. And we know that's where he's going to be. The dead in Christ will rise first. He sees the heaven, the heavens open. And he doesn't see the heavens open again until Christ comes back. Thank you. I worked with Jim for a little over 20 years in the fire service. And uh, one thing that I could say about Jim was that he took care of people. Uh, he, he took care of the people that uh, we served in the city. He took care of the fellow firefighters. He took care of me. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know why, but I think there were times when Jim thought that I was a problem child. <laughs> and uh, I know um, sometimes he would uh, be called to the office, speak to the chief or the uh, assistant chief, and, and he'd come back, he'd shake his head and said, Curtis, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. <laughs> but uh, he always took care of me, and he always took care of everybody else on the crew and all the other firefighters. And uh, Jim was... Um, and he took in when he was in the army, his job was an armorer, and he they would fly him to fire bases where he would work on the guns, he uh, particularly the heavy guns. And knowing Jim, I'm certain that he never left a fire base until those guns were in perfect operating condition, because he knew that those guns was what kept those soldiers alive and uh, he served them back then. Uh, Jim could tell a story. I, don't, I can't count the number of times that we'd be around the station and, and he'd tell, start talking about a fire we had and, and I'd think, well, yeah, I was there. And he'd start telling the story and then he would get more and more into the story and I'd think, well, wait a minute, I don't remember it like that. Maybe I was. <laughs> Maybe I wasn't at that fire. And uh, Jim never let the facts get in the way of a good story. I'm not saying he lied. It was a poetic license. But um, I know that one day I'll be in heaven with Jim, and I can just hear him now and say, Hey, Kirk, come here, let me tell you. Let me tell you what's been going on. But I know one thing for sure, he won't have to embellish because there'd be no way to embellish heaven. Well, my, my name is Griff Langston, and uh, I've been a, I'm an owner of Industrial Fire and Safety here in Birmingham. And I'll just tell you a quick few stories, uh, Jim. First of all, uh, <clears throat> I just really love Jim Norris. My father was running the business at the time, back in the 70s, and uh, he contacted Lieutenant Ford, who used to be a lieutenant over at Homewood Fire Department, and he asked him, he said, he said, Ford, I need somebody to help me. He said, I got a job, it won't last for about two weeks. I said, I need a good man. Lieutenant Ford told him, said, well, I got a good man for you. Jim Norris, I sent him over there. So Jim came over there for a two-week job. He ended up staying 41 years. <laughs> but he was so, <clears throat> I'll never forget, the, I, I was on the road selling at the time. I didn't even have time to know who my dad hired or anything. One day I told him, I said, Dad, I gotta have help on this job. He said, well, go back here in the back and get Jim. And I said, well, who's Jim? He said. I hired Jim months ago, and I said, well, let me go back there. Jim jumped right in and just finished the job for me. And, I mean, he he was just such a delight to be around. I'm real intense, and every time I'd get over the top intense, Jim would calm me down and tell me a joke. But he loved the Homewood Fire Department, and I know he loved all of y'all, but um, I just really appreciate it, Jim Norris. Thank you. I'm going to wrap things up here, but I, I thought I would just share um, 
from one other pastor's perspective, there was a young man that uh, really served this church faithfully uh, for many years, and I sent him the obituary. His name is um, Daniel Wilson, because uh, I knew he would want to know. And um, he sent me this text back. He's, he's a pastor out of, out of town. He says, he was quite a man. He and Dale Robertson, right back there, uh, drove the moving truck to Kentucky in May of 2005 to move Aaron and me down here. I grieve with his family. Um, Norris family, our prayers are with you. And we're, our, prayer, our, our hearts are full, um, but yet there's still a loss. We know, we know it, and we feel it with you. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over. We're going to sing a song, and then I'm going to pray. And, but uh, I appreciate it, what you shared today, and I want to encourage you. Share these stories again. Call Miss Jean up. Um, show up at the card making stamp class uh, um, and, and, and just share. Some of these memories uh, are so healing and um, don't keep them to yourselves. Um, we have been blessed. Um, I'm, and I'm, I'm just curious. I don't want to embarrass anyone. Uh, if you have lost a spouse, would you do me a favor? Would, would you just stand up if you have lost a spouse, just where you are. Miss Jean, I hope you can see, if you want to stand up, Miss Jean, th this is your support group. This is, these are the folks who you can call and, and they know what you're going through today because they've been in your shoes. All right, we love you. Let's conclude our remembrance and celebration by singing with gratitude to God be the glory. Great things he hath done as we stand together. To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Life and atonement for sin, and open the light gates that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. And Father, we commit Jim to you because you are faithful, you are trustworthy, you are true, and you have demonstrated that like no other through your son, Jesus. And so I pray as we stand here today and we watch him roll, his, his body uh, be carried out of this sanctuary, I pray that we are reminded, Lord, that you have already ushered him into your presence. And I thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you remain standing, please?
let me invite you to join us at Elmwood Cemetery as uh, Jim and his family uh, will be pulling out any moment. Thank you for coming.